So if you've got a relation and, um, you know, if you've got coordinates A comma B, right? Like a series of coordinates in a relation. Then if for each and every single one of them, you can get a corresponding coordinate B A by switching the coordinates, that's when you have an inverse relationship, okay? So take a look here. You've got this function y equals x squared minus 4, all right? And for that one, um, you pick certain x values, right? And then here are their y values, all right? Now, here is another equation y squared is equal to x plus 4, and we're going to do the same thing. Pick a little, pick a few x values, and we're going to come up with our y values, all right, from the equation. So what do you notice between the tables on the left and the right? What do you notice about their points? Yeah. Right, for each of the points, look, for one you have negative 3 comma 5, and then you have the corresponding 5 comma negative 3. And you can have that, you can see that relation for every single point. Pick any point at random, negative 1, negative 3, and in that table you've got the reverse, negative 3 comma negative 1, right? Right down to, you know, the last one. So that is an inverse relationship between the two of them, Okay. Now, if you were to graph the blue equation, that will give you this, y equals x squared minus 4. And we know that's a parabola shifted four units down, right? And if we graph the green, y squared is equal to x plus 4, well, that gives us this one, okay? And another relationship we can see, right? Let's take this point negative 3 comma 5, 5 comma negative 3. So negative 3 comma 5, that's this point right here, right, on the blue. Where is the corresponding one here? 5 comma negative 3 here, right? Look at that. One is the mirror image of the other one around that red dashed line, okay? Let's take another point. Let's take this point here. This is what? Negative 3 comma 0, right? What would it correspond to in the green one? 0 comma negative 3, right? Negative 3, 0, 0, negative 3. And look, that one too, it's like a mirror image. It's like mirrored around y equals x. Do you see that? And it's the same way for every single point. So that's another characteristic of two relations which are inverses of each other okay so that's what inverses um, that's how inverses are related to each other now if you have an inverse um, of a relation okay um, and if the inverse of a function is also a function then we call it an inverse function and the symbol for it is f to the minus one f inverse okay now this green one here is the inverse of the blue parabola is that green one a function no. it is not a function so you see every single inverse cannot be a function that means that this blue has an inverse but it doesn't have an inverse function okay all right so one way that we can tell that the green is not an inverse, that the green isn't a function is what? It doesn't pass the vertical line test, right? The green doesn't pass the horizontal line test. But if we were to look at this parabola, we could have known from just by looking at the parabola that it's not going to have an inverse function, okay? Because if I draw a horizontal line through that, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, so I know its inverse will not pass the vertical line test. So let's, with that, move on to 
here, the horizontal line test. If you have a function, you can figure out whether it will have an inverse function by doing the horizontal line test. So you can draw a series of horizontal lines, and if each of them passes the function one time, then we know, right, um, that its inverse will be a function, that it has an inverse function. Do you guys see what I mean? Okay. So moving on. Um, so this one, the instructions say the graph using a graphing calculator, but I don't think we need a graphing calculator. I think we could just visualize. If I graph that first one, A, what shape will that be? A parabola. Will it pass the horizontal line test? No. It will not. So I say it does not have an inverse function. Now the other one is a function that looks like this. And again, if you don't know exactly what that looks like, you would graph it. And just visually look at the graph. And does that one have an inverse function? Yes. Because it passes the horizontal line test. Yeah. All the ones that we've covered, yes, you have to have them memorized. Well, like this one, you could just graph it, but for like x to the third, we learned that you need to know. Okay. So if a function passes the horizontal line test, we say it's one to one. Okay. Um, so, for example, this is a function that's one to one because for each x value, there is only one y value, right? And if I pick any y value, there is only one x value. So that's one to one. This one is not one to one. Because if I were to pick a y value, right, it's got two x values, okay? So not one to one. All right, now here's the thing about functions and their inverses. Remember how we said um, in an inverse, uh, in, a, in a relation and its inverse, um, each coordinate appears again, but with the y and the x switched, right? So that means to go from a function to its inverse, you're exchanging the x and y coordinates. Well, in doing that, something else also happens. So if you have f of x, you've got the domain and range of f of x, right? What's the domain? It's all the possible x values for a function, and the range is all the possible y values. Well, if I switch f with its inverse, and if I switch the x's with the y's, then what also happens is the domain of f becomes the range of f inverse, and the range of f becomes the domain of f inverse, right? Because in going from a function to its inverse, the x's and y's swap, then so will the domain and the range. All right, more on this in a little bit. How do we find an inverse function? You've already done this in algebra two. So first, determine whether the function has an inverse. Uh, one sec. All right, so first, we have to determine whether the function the function has an inverse, right? Then we want to replace f of x with y, and we want to interchange x and y. Remember that? Next, we solve for y and replace y with f inverse, because it's called f inverse. And then we want to talk about any restrictions on the domain of f inverse. Okay, so let's do one. This first one here, you have to determine whether or not it has an inverse first. We do that 
by either inspecting it. If you know what it looks like, then you know what it looks like. If not, you can graph it on your calculator and see if it passes the horizontal line test. So this specific one, it does pass the horizontal line test because it's a graph that looks like a reciprocal function, okay? So now we want to determine its inverse. All right, so we first write it as y equals x over 2x minus 1. Then interchange x and y. So x equals y over 2x, uh, 2y minus 1. And now I want to solve for y. This is the part that you should really know from Algebra 2, right? We solve for y. Let's cross multiply. x times 2y minus 1 is equal to y. Distribute 2xy minus x is equal to y. 2xy plus y is equal to x. Subtracted y from both sides, added x to both sides. Right. So next, I'm gonna solve, I'm gonna factor out a y. 2x minus 1 is equal to x. So y is x over 2x minus 1, but I need to call it f inverse of x, x over 2x minus 1, right? So that's the inverse. What do you notice? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So guess what? This function is its own inverse because if you graph and you look at it, if you graph, uh, if you draw y equals x through it, do you see how like, you can fold this whole graph around that red y equals x and all parts will match perfectly? So it's its own inverse, which is super cool. All right, restrictions. The denominator of this can't equal 0, right? Mm -hmm. So 2x can't equal 1, which means x can't equal 1 half. All right, so that's the restriction. So the domain is negative infinity to a half and a half to infinity, okay? That's the interval over which this inverse function will exist. Okay, next. Let's do another one. So here I have what shape? A square root graph. Does that pass the horizontal line test? It does. And if I just happen to graph this, there is a shift to the right by one unit. So this kind of looks like that. All right? Well, okay, so that means I can find the inverse function here. y equals 2 root x minus 1. Switch x and y. x equals 2 root y minus 1. Square both sides in order to get rid of the root, and I get x squared is equal to 4y minus 1. So x squared is 4y minus 4. x squared plus 4 is 4y. Divide by 4. y is... 1 over 4x squared plus 1. But I need to write it as an inverse function. That's that. So what shape is that? That's a parabola. Let me graph that parabola. It's got an upward shift of 1. That's what that parabola looks like. Okay? Yes. Well, there is a reason why I wrote it that way. It's because I wanted to graph it. Either way is fine, but I wanted to graph it and I wanted to see exactly what it looked like. So look at that. Now, does that parabola look like it's the proper inverse of the square root function that I started with? No. Why not? 
Huh? Huh? It doesn't match. Why? Why doesn't it match? Is what I'm asking. Oh, because the first one Right. Right. So the first one, the purple, it looks like it's only half of that parabola, right? When I drew the blue parabola following the function that I got for the inverse, I gained a whole extra half here that I didn't have before. So if I were to get rid of it, now does it look more like the inverse of the function I had before? It does. So that means I need to restrict the domain of that parabola in order for it to match what I have. So the restricted domain then, it's going to be x equals 0 to infinity, and that's where I have the proper inverse. Okay, so yes, the inverse function is the parabola, but only starting at x equals zero and moving to infinity. Okay, why, all right. Why well, because mathematically, uh -huh. if you you know if you solve this equation for y, yeah, that's like, uh, that's yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at this next one m of x is equal to x squared, right? But it says x is within 0 to infinity. So let me graph m of x. That's x squared. But the domain is only from 0 to infinity, so just that, okay? So that's m of x from 0 to infinity. Okay? All right. Um, the same situation, y equals x squared. That means x equals y squared. Take a square root of both sides. y is plus or minus root x. So which one of those do I take? Just the positive one. So I say f inverse of x is positive root x. Okay? All right. Any questions? <clears throat> All right. Well, let's talk about compositions of inverse functions. All right. Inverse functions are related in yet another way. Um, in order for two functions to be inverse functions, here's what else needs to happen. f of g of x needs to equal x. g of f of x needs to equal x. All right, so in this next example, um, we're going to switch out this word show and we want to make it verify. Show is different, verifying is different. We want to verify that f and g are inverses of each other. Okay? So what I do here is I split my workspace into two. On the one side, I want to find f of g of x. And on the other side, I want to find g of f of x. Okay. So f of g of x, this is what you were doing yesterday. Um, I want to put g inside of f, so I have the square root of x squared minus 10x plus 33 minus 8 plus 5. <coughs> okay? So let's simplify that a little bit. I have the square root of x squared minus 10x plus 25 plus 5, but wait a minute, that factors to x minus 5 squared plus 5, and what happens with the square root of a square? It's just x minus 5 plus 5, and lo and behold, f of g of x is equal to just x. 
Okay? So that's fine. Now I need to find g of f of x. So I need to put um, f into g. Well, the way that's going to work is, here we go. I have x minus 8 plus 5 squared minus 10 times root x minus 8 plus 5 plus 33. So it takes a bit, right? All right. Let's multiply the first parenthesis squared. I, mult I square the first term, I get x minus 8. The middle term is 2 times 5, positive 10 times root x minus 8, plus 25. So that's just the first parenthesis. Distribute the negative 10. Um, negative 10 times the root minus 50 plus 33. Whew. Okay. So, oh, look at that. 10 times the root minus 10 times the root. Go away. So I've got x minus 8. Do the bookkeeping properly here. Plus 25 minus 50 plus 33. This is negative 25. Minus 8 is negative 33. Plus 33 goes away. So g of f of x is equal to x after all that. So look at what we've got. f of g of x was x. G of f of x was x. When you get x for both of them, then you can say, yes, they are inverses. Okay? Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, what if you get 0, 0? What if you get 2, 2, 5, 5? Nope. Doesn't work. It's an all or nothing deal. You either have to get x's for both of them, or it doesn't work. Okay? And if you do the first one, you don't get an x, it already fails, so you could just move on. Okay, yes? Uh, is the greater than or equal to 5? Yes, the greater than, yes. What do you think? What, what do you think is the purpose of that? Yeah. Right. The first one is a square. Uh, it's a square. It's a, it's a square root. Okay? But the next one is a parabola. So it looks like this, right? So we have to restrict the domain. Good. Okay. Lastly, let's use the graph to sketch an inverse. Yes. Wait, so when you say that it's like it can only be x, it doesn't have to be x alone? Like it, so it can't be like x? Just x. Plain old x. Okay, so like not like 2x or nope. anything? Nope, just, just x. Stuff. Okay. All right, before I start with this one, here is the question I want to ask you, a bonus question. So what you have here is f of x, right? That's the graph of f of x. My bonus question to you is, what is the domain of f inverse of x? I don't want the domain of f of x. I know that. That's negative 3 to infinity. I want the domain of f inverse of x. Yes? Maybe. Maybe. No. Do you? Agree with? Right. So like this? That's what I'm looking for. This is the this describes the correct region. But it's you always start from the lower number to the upper number. So what you do, right, we take the domain 
to find the domain of the inverse, we look at the range of f. The range of f is from negative infinity to 0, and that automatically is the domain. So I don't need the function. I don't need anything, right? I just know that the relationship between a function and its, and its inverse is that the domain and the range switch. Okay, so next, we want to graph the inverse of this. So what you want to do is you want to pick a couple of points on the graph of f, right? Some representative points. And I like to pick like the, the easy points. So the end point is definitely one you want to pick. That's negative 3 comma 0. Another one, I like to pick ones on the corner. So this one, you know, negative 2 comma negative 1. 1 comma negative 2 is a good one to pick. What's a, what else is a good one? 6 and negative 3 is a good one to pick. And then, so these are points on f of x. To get the corresponding points on f inverse of x, I just have to get the, I just have to swap the order pair. So 0 comma negative 3, just switch. Negative 1 comma negative 2. Negative 2 comma 1. Negative 3 comma 0. Oh, 6, sorry. That looked like a 0. See? You got to have proper writing. All right. So let's graph that. So 0 comma negative 3. Negative 1 comma negative 2. Here. Uh, no, sorry. Negative 1 comma negative 2. Negative 2 comma 1. And then negative 3 comma 6. So that's how this looks. Whoops. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the corresponding points. Let's draw y equals x here. Okay. Let's take a look at corresponding points. This point corresponds to that one. Look, it's a mirror image. This point corresponds to that one, that one to that one, this one to that one. So again, if I take this entire grid, fold it diagonally around y equals x, do you see how the function and its inverse will line up perfectly? That's how we know they're inverses. Okay? All right. Last but not least. Okay, so, yes, yes, so let's talk about, all right, so let's, let's pick some points here. Um, 1 comma 0 is a good point, and the inverse will be, right, another one, okay, so look, there are no other ones that are on the corner, right, so we have to sort of like eyeball, so if you take this point here, okay, the x is somewhere between 2 and 3. The y coordinate is 1. The corresponding point in the inverse will be x will be 1, y will be somewhere between 2 and 3. Okay, bye. What else do we know here? We know that in going from the function to its inverse, the domain and range will swap. We also know everything associated with the x's on one will become associated with the y's on the other and vice versa. So I see here that there is a vertical asymptote, right, at x equals zero. And it's like near the negatives, right? Near the negatives. Well, it's in like the negative 3, 4, 5. Y equals negative 3, 4, 5. Here. What is the vertical? Well, it's... it's oh, oh, the asymptote. Okay. Okay. So that means in the inverse, this will switch to a horizontal asymptote at Y equals 0 near the negatives. Okay? 
So it'll it'll go to you know like an it'll follow like an asymptote here. Yes. And so what were some of the other points? We had one comma zero. And then I had when x was, I'm sorry, no, sorry, 0, 1, I'm sorry, 0, 1, this one. And then when x is 1, y should be between 2 and 3 here, right? This one. And then it kind of like follows upward. So there okay and again if you look around this one do you see how they're still mirror images yeah okay all right um so that's lesson seven